My husband's affair was with my best friend. Now they want my help after their perfect life fell apart. I always believed my marriage to Jason was solid. We had been together for seven years, married for five, and life seemed like it was falling into place. We had our cosy little home, our shared dreams of travelling the world, and the unspoken understanding that we were each other's rock. And then, in one heart-wrenching moment, everything shattered. It started with a hunch, the kind you get when something isn't quite right, but you can't put your finger on it. Jason had been distant for months, but I chalked it up to stress at work. I noticed he was glued to his phone more often than usual, always quick to flip it face down when I walked into the room. Late night work calls became more frequent and his excuses more flimsy. One night, curiosity got the better of me. Jason had fallen asleep on the couch, his phone still clutched in his hand. With a mix of dread and determination, I gently pried it from his grasp and unlocked it using his fingerprint. What I found confirmed my worst fears. A string of texts and photos from my best friend Amy. My hands trembled as I scrolled through the messages. There were months worth of exchanges, intimate confessions, plans for secret rendezvous, and photos that left no room for doubt. The betrayal cut deep. Not only had my husband been unfaithful, but he had chosen to do so with the one person I trusted most in the world. I couldn't breathe. It felt like my chest was caving in, the walls closing around me. I needed air, space to think, but all I could do was stare at the damning evidence. How could they do this to me? The two people I loved most in the world had conspired to tear my life apart. The next morning, I confronted Jason. I had barely slept, my mind racing with a thousand thoughts and a million questions. As he groggily sipped his coffee, I placed his phone on the table and asked, Why Jason? Why her? He didn't even try to deny it. His face went pale and his eyes widened in shock and guilt. I'm sorry, Claire, he stammered. I never meant for this to happen. It just did. His pathetic excuse only fueled my anger. It just happened? You expect me to believe that? You betrayed me, Jason, and with Amy, of all people. How could you? Tears streamed down my face as I unleashed my fury. Jason tried to reach out to me, but I recoiled, disgusted by his touch. Don't, just don't, I spat. You need to leave, now. As he packed a bag, I called Amy. She didn't answer so I left a message, my voice trembling with rage and sorrow. I know everything, Amy. You're not my friend. You're a backstabbing, deceitful person, and I never want to see you again. In the days that followed, the pain was almost unbearable. I felt like a part of me had been ripped away, leaving a gaping wound that refused to heal. Jason moved in with Amy, and their betrayal became the talk of our small town. Friends and neighbours gossiped, but their pity only made me feel worse. It was in those darkest moments that I realised I had two choices. Let their betrayal destroy me or find the strength to rebuild my life. I chose the latter, but it was no easy task. Each day was a battle to put one foot in front of the other, to not let the bitterness consume me. I started with small steps, therapy sessions, reconnecting with family and distancing myself from anything that reminded me of them. Slowly, very slowly, I began to reclaim my sense of self. I found solace in new hobbies, buried myself in work, and discovered a resilience I never knew I had. But even as I moved forward, the shadows of their betrayal lingered. Every now and then, I'd hear about them through mutual friends. It was like reopening a wound that had barely begun to heal. Yet with each passing day, I grew stronger, determined to build a life where their betrayal would no longer define me. The initial aftermath of Jason and Amy's betrayal was a blur of pain and confusion, but I knew I couldn't let it consume me forever. My first step towards healing was therapy. I found a compassionate therapist named Dr. Harris, who helped me navigate the tangled mess of my emotions. Our sessions were raw and intense, but they became a safe space where I could unravel my feelings of anger, betrayal and loss. You have every right to be angry, Claire, Dr. Harris would say but don't let that anger define your future. Taking her advice to heart, I began to focus on myself. I quit my job at the marketing firm where Jason and I had met and found a new position at a startup. The work was challenging and demanding, but it was also a welcome distraction. My new colleagues were supportive and kind. 
and slowly I began to feel a sense of belonging again. Outside of work, I threw myself into activities that made me feel alive. I took up yoga, which helped me find inner peace and balance. I joined a book club where I met people who shared my love for literature. These new connections were vital in helping me rebuild my social circle, replacing the void left by Amy's betrayal. My family, especially my sister Emma, was my rock. She listened to my endless rants, wiped my tears and cheered me on every step of the way. You deserve so much better, Claire, she'd say, her voice filled with conviction. And one day, you'll look back on this and realise how strong you've become. Inspired by her words, I started a small business on the side, selling handmade jewellery. What began as a therapeutic hobby quickly turned into a passion. I spent hours designing and crafting pieces, pouring my heart and soul into every creation. To my surprise, the business took off. Customers loved my work, and soon I was making enough to consider it a full-time venture. With every success, my confidence grew. I no longer saw myself as the woman who had been betrayed, but as someone capable, resilient and worthy of happiness. Yet, despite the progress I made, there were still moments when the past would rear its ugly head. Hearing their names, seeing an old photo or running into mutual friends could send me spiralling back into a pit of despair. One evening, about two years after the betrayal, I was at a local cafe working on my latest jewellery designs, when I overheard a conversation at the next table. Did you hear about Jason and Amy? They're in serious trouble, a voice said. I couldn't help but eavesdrop, my heart pounding in my chest. Yeah, Jason lost his job and Amy's been really sick. They're struggling to make ends meet, another voice responded. The news hit me like a punch to the gut. Part of me felt a twisted sense of satisfaction. Karma, perhaps but another part of me felt an unexpected pang of empathy. Despite everything, I couldn't entirely shut off the feelings I once had for Jason, nor could I ignore the years of friendship with Amy. As the days went by, I found myself thinking more and more about their situation. It was during one of these contemplative moments that my phone buzzed with an incoming call. It was a number I didn't recognise, but I answered it anyway. Claire, it's Amy, the voice on the other end said sounding fragile and hesitant. I know I have no right to ask, but we need help. Jason lost his job and I'm sick. We've exhausted all our options. Please, can we meet? Her plea left me speechless. Part of me wanted to hang up, to tell her she deserved whatever hardship she was facing. But another part of me, the part that still believed in compassion and forgiveness, hesitated. Amy, I don't know if I can do this, I replied, my voice shaky. Please, Claire, she begged. I know we hurt you and I'm so sorry, but we're desperate. I agreed to meet her, more out of curiosity than anything else. When I saw her, I barely recognised the woman sitting across from me. Amy looked pale and frail, a shadow of her former self. Her eyes were filled with remorse and exhaustion. She recounted their downfall, how Jason's reckless behaviour had led to his job loss and how her illness had drained their savings. They were on the brink of losing everything. We have nowhere else to turn, Claire, she said, tears streaming down her face. Please help us. In that moment, I realised I had a choice to make. I could turn my back on them, letting their suffering be the consequence of their actions. Or I could rise above the pain they had caused me, showing them the kindness they had denied me. My heart battled with my mind. Torn between justice and compassion, I needed time to think to decide what kind of person I wanted to be in the face of their plea. As I walked away from that meeting, I knew whatever decision I made would define my future, a testament to the strength I'd found within myself. After my meeting with Amy, I spent days wrestling with my emotions. I couldn't deny the satisfaction of seeing them suffer, a small, vindictive part of me enjoying their downfall. But as the days turned into weeks, I couldn't shake the nagging feeling that I needed to make a decision one that would define who I was and who I wanted to become. I talked to Emma about it, my constant sounding board. Do you think I should help them? I asked, half hoping she'd give me a clear answer. Honestly, Claire, only you can decide that, she replied thoughtfully. But remember, helping them doesn't mean you have to forgive them. It just means you're choosing to be the bigger person. 
her words stuck with me. I wanted to be the bigger person, the one who rose above the pain and showed kindness, even when it wasn't deserved. But was I ready for that? One evening, as I was closing up my little jewellery studio, my phone rang again. This time it was Jason. I almost didn't answer, but curiosity got the better of me. Hello? Claire, it's Jason. Thank you for agreeing to talk to Amy. I know we don't deserve your help, but we're desperate, he said, his voice filled with a humility I'd never heard before. Hearing him so vulnerable was strange. This was the man who had shattered my heart, and now he was asking for my mercy. Why should I help you, Jason, after everything you put me through? I asked, my voice colder than I intended. I know I hurt you, Claire, and I'm sorry, more than you'll ever know. We were selfish and stupid and we're paying for it now. But Amy's really sick. She needs treatment and we can't afford it, he pleaded. His words softened something in me. I remembered the love I once had for him, the dreams we had shared. Despite everything, a part of me still cared, if only a little. I'll think about it, I said finally, but don't expect anything. That night I couldn't sleep. I replayed our conversation over and over in my mind, weighing my options. By morning, I knew what I had to do. It wasn't about them, it was about me. I needed to prove to myself that I was stronger than the pain they had caused. I called them both and arranged to meet at a cafe. When I arrived, Jason and Amy were already there, looking more worn and defeated than I had ever seen them. Amy's face was gaunt, her eyes dull with exhaustion. Jason looked older, the weight of their troubles etched into his features. Claire, thank you for coming. Amy said, her voice barely above a whisper. I nodded, taking a seat across from them. I've thought a lot about this, I began, trying to keep my voice steady, and I've decided to help you, but there are conditions. Jason and Amy exchanged a hopeful glance. Anything, Jason said quickly. Well, do anything. First, I want you to understand that this doesn't mean I forgive you. What you did was unforgivable, and I need you to acknowledge that, I said firmly. They both nodded, their expressions solemn. We understand, Amy said, her eyes filling with tears. And we're truly sorry, Claire, for everything. Second, I'll help you financially with Amy's treatment and provide some support while Jason looks for a job. But you need to pay me back when you can. This isn't a gift. It's a loan, I continued. Of course, Jason agreed. We'll pay you back every cent. And lastly, I added, I need you both to stay out of my life. Once you're back on your feet, I don't want any contact. This is the last time we'll interact. They both looked taken aback, but nodded in agreement. We understand, Claire, and we're grateful, Jason said, his voice choked with emotion. With that, I began the process of helping them. I arranged for Amy's medical treatment, covering the initial costs, and set up a small fund to help them with living expenses. It wasn't easy, and part of me resented every dollar I spent. But as time went on, I felt a sense of peace. I was doing the right thing, not for them, but for myself. A few months later, I received a letter from Amy. She thanked me profusely, updating me on her health and their improved situation. Jason had found a new job, and they were slowly getting back on their feet. She promised they would start repaying me as soon as possible, and reiterated their deep remorse for the pain they had caused. Reading her words, I felt a mix of emotions, relief, closure, and a strange sense of finality. I had done what I needed to do, and now it was time to move on completely. Their chapter in my life was finally closed, and I was free to focus entirely on my future. I threw myself into my business, expanding it beyond what I had ever dreamed possible. The jewellery line grew, and soon I had a small team working with me. I travelled, met new people, and embraced the life I had rebuilt from the ashes of betrayal. But most importantly, I found myself again, stronger, wiser, and more compassionate than I had ever been. And in that journey, I discovered that true healing comes not from forgetting the past, but from rising above it and choosing to be better, even when the world has shown you its worst. Months turned into a year, and life settled into a new rhythm. My jewellery business flourished, expanding beyond my wildest dreams. The pieces I created seemed to resonate with people, each one a testament to my journey from pain to empowerment. With each success, 
I felt further removed from the betrayal that had once threatened to consume me. One evening, as I was closing up my studio, I received an unexpected visit from Emma. She walked in with a bright smile and a twinkle in her eye, carrying a bottle of wine. I thought we could celebrate your latest milestone, she said, referring to the feature my business had just received in a popular lifestyle magazine. You're the best, I said, hugging her tightly. We sat together, laughing and reminiscing about our childhood, the tough times, and how far we'd both come. As the evening wore on, the conversation turned serious. Have you heard from Jason and Amy? Emma asked, her tone cautious. Not recently, I admitted. They sent a few repayments, but other than that, we've had no contact, which is exactly what I wanted. Emma nodded, taking a sip of her wine. Do you ever wonder how they're doing? I shrugged, feeling a pang of guilt. Sometimes, but I've moved on, and I hope they have too. It's just easier that way. A few days later, I received a letter in the mail. It was from Jason, written in his familiar handwriting. My heart raced as I opened it, unsure of what to expect. Dear Claire, I hope this letter finds you well. I wanted to reach out and let you know that Amy and I are doing better. Thanks to your help, Amy's health has improved significantly, and I found steady employment. We are forever grateful for your kindness and generosity. I know you asked for no further contact, and I respect that. But I needed to tell you something. Helping us the way you did showed me what true strength and compassion look like. I've spent the past months reflecting on my actions and the pain I caused you. There are no words to truly express my remorse. Amy and I are working hard to repay the loan, and we will continue to do so until every cent is returned. I hope that one day you can find it in your heart to forgive us, not for our sake, but for yours. Wishing you all the happiness and success in the world. Sincerely, Jason. Reading his words, I felt a strange mix of emotions. Anger, sadness, but also a sense of closure. I had already decided to forgive them in my heart, if not to forget. This letter was the final piece of that puzzle allowing me to fully release the lingering resentment I had carried. A few weeks later, as I was walking through the park near my home, I spotted a familiar figure sitting on a bench. It was Amy. She looked healthier, more vibrant, yet still carried the weight of our shared past in her eyes. Our gazes met, and for a moment we simply stared at each other, the air heavy with unspoken words. She stood up and walked over to me. Claire, I didn't expect to see you here. Neither did I, I replied, my voice soft. How are you? I'm doing better thanks to you, she said, tears welling up. I know we agreed to stay out of each other's lives, but I needed to thank you in person. I nodded, feeling a lump in my throat. I'm glad you're better, Amy, truly. We stood there in silence for a moment, the weight of our history hanging between us. I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive us some day, she said, finally. I already have, I replied, surprising myself with the truth of those words. But forgiveness doesn't mean things can go back to the way they were. She nodded, understanding. I know, thank you, Claire, for everything. With that, we parted ways, both of us walking towards our respective futures. In the months that followed, I focused on my happiness. I travelled more met new people, and even started dating again. Life had a way of surprising me, of offering new opportunities just when I needed them most. One sunny afternoon, as I was setting up for a local craft fair, a man approached my booth. He had a warm smile and an air of confidence that was instantly appealing. Hi, I'm Mark, he said, extending his hand. I've seen your work online and wanted to check it out in person. Nice to meet you, Mark, I replied, shaking his hand. I hope it lives up to your expectations. We chatted for a while, and as the conversation flowed, I felt a spark that I hadn't felt in a long time. He was kind, funny, and genuinely interested in my story. By the end of the fair, he had asked me out for coffee, and I found myself saying yes. As we sat in a cosy cafe, sharing stories and laughter, I realised something profound. Life had brought me full circle. I had faced betrayal, endured heartbreak and emerged stronger. And now I was open to the possibility of love again. Reflecting on my journey, I felt a deep sense of gratitude, not for the pain, 
but for the growth it had spurred. I had learned to forgive, to rise above, and to embrace the future with an open heart. To everyone reading this, thank you for sharing in my story. I've come to realise that life is a series of challenges and triumphs, and it's how we respond to them that defines who we are. Have you ever faced a similar situation? How did you handle it? I'd love to hear your thoughts and experiences.